Bangkok and beyond, and I'm Bari Sajdari, your host, your moderator for this session as well. For this session, uh, it has been made possible uh, and, uh, with the support from two magazines, and we're delighted to welcome uh, Kevin Kwan, who is the author of Crazy Rich Asians, and uh, Hyun Bang Shin is an expert in on uh, gentrification in Asia, and Kun Titinan Bong Sotirak, who is the uh, head of the Institute of Security and International Studies to the panel. Uh, what is the new Asia and how does it relate to the world? And this session will be moderated by Gwen Robinson. She's the uh, chief editor of the Nikkei Asian Review after a long career with Financial Times and also uh, wearing two hats. Another hat is uh, the senior fellow at the uh, same institution as Dr. Titi Nan. So please welcome all of them on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, um, happy Valentine's Day. No one said that, I think, yet. Um, so today we're gathered to talk about New Asia, which is a, a rather big topic. Um, and uh, we'll hear from our panelists uh, very soon, but shortly. Uh, but first, I, I'll introduce them very briefly. Uh, and also the topic, because I think the term New Asia can mean many things, uh, broadly, though they fall into what I call two main categories, positive and negative, good New Asia and bad New Asia, from economics and politics to security, diplomacy, and above all, society, the trends sweep in the region. A lot is happening to and inside Asia. Um, and I, I'm constantly struck how, particularly with Asia, though with many regions of the world, outside observers tend to lump the region into one big mass called Asia. Um, and this is, I think, to me, rather like talking about Europe and asking how Europe is faring. Well, from Greece, which we all know has had problems, to the UK, there's no way you can talk about Europe as a monolithic region. And similarly, when talking of New Asia, we're talking about more than 5 billion people, countries as diverse as China, Japan, and um, by some definitions, even Australia and New Zealand and the South Pacific. Um, income levels from rock bottom to insanely rich, and systems ranging from hardline authoritarianism, such as North Korea, and let's not forget, North Korea is as Asian as Japan and uh, China, to vibrant democracies like the Philippines. And um, so when we're talking about New Asia, we'll talk about the positive and negative trends. So briefly, our panel today covers the whole gamut, so we're very lucky to have with us um, Kevin Kwan, through his best-selling books, Crazy Rich Asians and Now China Rich Girlfriend, has charted the rise of the new young money class in Asia. And um, uh, at the end there, Dr. Titi Nam, um, director, as you've heard of the uh, Institute of Security and International Studies, has tracked the changing dynamics of the region and the new diplomacy and security priorities of a more assertive Asia. But he's also done a lot of work on the socio-cultural and economic aspects, and particularly the evolution of the ASEAN economic community. So hopefully we'll hear um, some deeper insights from him. And uh, and Hyun Jin of the LSE, uh, who's newly planned for Benetton. Hello? Uh, newly published Planetary Gentrification has examined urbanisation trends in Asia and the impact of state policies and rising affluence on cities, which is a critical trend now in, in Asia, is this whole um, trend migration in from the countryside into the cities, what cities are becoming, their values. So I want to ask each of our panellists, um, uh, but first we'll outline a broad question and ask them to consider. If we're dividing the new Asia into good new Asia and bad new Asia, um, you know, you can consider the positives, such as strong economic growth, rising affluence and emerging middle class, rapid development of infrastructure, cities, manufacturing bases, growing access to services, such as social services, health, education, and political and social development. Myanmar was a brutal authoritarian regime five years ago and now it's a beacon of democracy. Um, we've seen some backsliding in certain countries, which I won't really go into here, but I think we all know uh, one of them. 
And then if we're talking about bad New Asia, there's increasingly unequal income distribution, the limits to economic growth, uh, and the middle income trap, I think a, a topic that you've been very articulate about, Dr. Ding Nam. Aging Asia, demographics, I mean, Asia's now particularly China as a result of the one, one child policy, and Japan, uh, we all know, is having huge problems with aging population. And soaring security concerns, uh, tensions in the South China Sea, um, the threat of nuclear arm North Korea, the arms race going on in the region, and uh, above all, I think that social tensions resulting as, uh, from all of that, and urbanization, rural migration, urban congestion, climate change, and we all know about the environmental problems, particularly in China. So what is the new Asia? And on some balance, is it better or worse than the old Asia? I think I'll pass over to Kevin to kick this off. Maybe you could talk um, along the themes that you've raised, which are more like socio, cultural, and about you know income distribution, particularly of the top end. What happens when crazy rich Asians become older, more sane, and poorer? <laughs> I'll borrow your mic. Thank you. I, I think on, on you know on the good part of Asia, um, most of Southeast Asia likes to consider itself good at this point. And the bad part is, is mainland China. You know, it seems to me like every week I see another headline about you know how badly behaved the mainland Chinese are when they come outside of mainland China, whether it's Thailand or Hong Kong or Singapore or the rest of the world. Um, there seems to be a burgeoning conflict, and I think the conflict is, is really co an economic one, really, because the buying power of the mainland Chinese now I think is, is beginning to really surpass the rest of Asia and it's creating all these very interesting little social problems. Um, so I think, number one, that's, that's an interesting thing you should look at. But you also see a divergence in the core values between the older, more affluent Asian societies, like Thailand, like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and what's happening in mainland China. And that divergence you know, with mainland China sort of in this economic you know, power mode, where they're expanding, expanding, shopping, shopping, consuming, consuming, and sort of buying up the rest of Asia is really causing a lot of very real problems for the other people that live in countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, where they're really starting to get priced out. You know, the normal people, not the crazy rich. So, as a, it really is, and and it's changing in a profound way. It's changing even culturally. <laughs> You know, this overdevelopment um, is really kind of causing a lot of, I think, cultural heritage damage. Um, this week, the last home of Sir Stanford, Stanford Raffles, the founder of Singapore, um, was demolished. And uh, it was in Penang, and they're going to build a hotel, an apartment complex, and a mall, you know, as usual. Um, you know, in Singapore, you know, Bukit Brown, you know, probably one of the oldest cemeteries in Southeast Asia, with amazing sort of, you know, treasure trove of, of old Singapore buried there and these amazing graves that are a hybrid of Veronica and Malay and Chinese and even Indian influences, you know, there's a highway through it now. So there are a lot of real problems, you know, sort of affecting all these other countries that comes from rising affluence. So what's your Yeah, I think it's, it's complicated answer. I think it's good answer. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me today uh, uh, and yesterday uh, to this festival. It's a great experience here so far, and I really congrat congratulate uh, the, uh, the organizers for all the efforts to put together these great sessions and great experiences together. Uh, where I can perhaps start with some of the uh, um, experiences that I had while teaching at the LSE, uh, especially in relation to how Asia has come about to exist and how Asia has, uh, uh, can be recognized as a very dynamic region. Chinese students are very, very, very much feeding UK universities nowadays. The so UK universities can only survive by inviting very not solely, but UK universities financial wise depend heavy, heavily on 
having these Chinese students coming to the UK to study. When you look at 10 years ago, what sort of uh, subjects uh, these Chinese students were choosing, which I'm, I'm here referring to mainly Chinese students, they were mostly look, uh, coming to LSE to study economics, international relations, or the politics. When you look at the kind of topics that they choose nowadays, and in the last five, uh, five to seven years, it has changed quite a bit. They choose social psychology, they choose social policy, they choose mass uh, media, com media and communication studies. Now they choose these more soft topics, which were not kind of in, a, uh, in, in their consideration about 10 years ago. What I'm trying to say is, as Asia has become affluent, and as Asia's young generations uh, come about to uh, enjoy the kind of affluence that their parents' generation created and produced, they also come to, uh, um, they also try to learn more about their own society. And here, one of the uh, talks that I was attending about you know, a few weeks ago, it was about Hong Kong's umbrella of revolution. And one, one, one interesting question from the audience was, what do Chinese tourists or uh, Chinese students who are uh, visiting Hong Kong talk about the umbrella revolution in Hong Kong? Uh, one of the panelists was a, a journalist, and I, I won't name the, the, the company. Uh, it, it's not associated with uh, uh, Gwen so and so so, <laughs> so uh, nothing to do with DK uh, 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 or Financial Times. But uh, she was saying where, or Hong Kong is basically, um, uh, as a Hong Kongist, she was saying, where well, Chinese students don't know about all these politics. And I was like, well, it's not really true, because many of these Chinese students from mainland China who are taking my course, of course, my course is surface very much on inequality in Asia and in China as well, so maybe my sample is very, uh, very much biased. But many of these Chinese students who are in their early 20s and mid 20s are really care, uh, paying attention to the issues of regional inequality issues of social inequality and trying to really uh, learn something in order to contribute to the country and trying to um, make things better, trying to reduce inequality and how to you know, go about doing this. One of the Chinese alumni from uh, LSE was giving a talk at the uh, LSE has this Beijing uh, graduation ceremony every summer uh, while we uh, run the uh, Beijing Summer School. So I was there as well, and this, uh, uh, the person who was giving this talk was a, uh, a young a, a woman in, the, in, in her early 30, uh, 30s, who was working really hard to, on the issues of environmental protection in China. And it also kind of shows you know, how much the uh, younger generations um, are actually you know, caring a bit more about the society, especially in a country like China. And I think that's a really a positive thing that we can uh, uh, take away from the experience of Asia before I go into more negative things. <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's the beginnings, but uh, clearly not a huge trend because what we're seeing in China is still overwhelmingly dominated by you know, the environmental destruction and the kind of, you know, uh, yes, of disregard for individual rights. Of yes, of course. I mean, going into negative things, I mean, what, I, mean, I, I hear, I was kind of thinking about this one particular expression by, uh, I won't go into academic jargons, but this one expression by a French political ecologist called André Gaulle, who was talking about, you know, in relation to the Western economies, uh, how, the, how the West has produced this poverty of affluence, which he was, he was trying to highlight, as the economies were growing more affluent and richer, compared to what it used to be, what they used to be about in a few decades or centuries ago. Uh, more wealth are uh, going into the position of, of very few, and many people are losing the opportunities to actually climb up the ladder in the society. And we are actually producing this a huge barriers for younger generations to be able to reach out and, and to be able to uh, raise their status in the society. I think when I look at Asian countries, Despite this huge condensed experience of urbanization, industrialization, and economic development, and Asian economies, many of these economies have certainly reached the status in you know, many uh, powerful Western economies nowadays. But then again, when you look at the uh, kind of internal dynamics, yes, it, it is a, a, a dynamic region. Yes, the countries have uh, produced a huge amount of wealth in, when you look at all these statistics and so on. But when you actually look at the kind of internal details, you are 
the Asian economies are actually creating this huge gap between generations, huge gap between <coughs> people who are living in different regions. Regional inequalities and social inequalities are you know, growing really big. One example I, I choose is the housing issue. So, paraphrasing under Gore's, and, uh, Gore's expression, poverty of affluence, I, I, come up, I, I use the expression, the housing and poverty of affluence. When you look around these Asian cities, there are so much huge amount of construction to add new housing units to all these cities. If, uh, if, when you go to Shanghai and Beijing, of course, they've been doing this for many decades now. When you go to other more remote cities in China, in western or central part of China, they also mimic the experience of Shanghai and, 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 and Beijing. Shanghai and Beijing were mimicking the experience of Singapore or Hong Kong previously. Many of the uh, uh, housing policies that uh, China uh, came about to implement in the early 1990s were actually learned from the experience of Singapore. Um, but when you look at all these experiences, despite adding huge amount of housing stocks, these are largely uh, creating more uh, ex the feeling of poverty for ordinary people. So poverty itself, we, uh, we understand this on absolute experience, but actually poverty, poverty is actually a relative term. Asian economic development has created this whole uh, uh, produced a reduction of poverty, and that's for sure. And, and we, we uh, thank China for having done that, and the global community thanks China for reducing the global uh, absolute poverty. But then again, we actually created more poverty in terms of the relative poverty. As, as we uh, in, uh, gain affluence, we, when, you, when people look around, when ordinary people look around, you know, they see the increasingly greater gap between what they have, what they ex uh, are able to afford, and what other people are able to afford. And this relative experience of poverty has grown to be uh, so big in Asian economies. And this has also produced greater gap between younger and older generations. And I think Kevin might also be uh, 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 talking about this as well later on, but I think there's huge issues about you know, how the affluence and success created uh, and secured, uh, secured by older generations who are behind this economic drive during the last few decades. These experiences are not going to be the experience of younger generation, which I, I think I can be quite sure to say this for many Asian economies. I think you've drawn a very mixed view as well, so I presume you've got sort of mixed sort of uh, feelings, whether it's positive, overall, or negative? Uh, overall, I'm quite negative, but I want to remain positive. In right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll revisit that, and you're right, it goes back to your earlier point about Asian values as well, but we'll come back to that, and maybe over to you for now, Titing. I'm also I'm, I'm quite interested how all this, we had an excellent drawing of the, the yeah. social, economic, inequality, values, and, but also we're in the middle of like this, increasingly tense region with a kind of arms race going on and concerns about security and that. You know, how does all this play out with that? That's a more sort of traditional um, sort of way to look at Asian rivalries and uh, anyway, but I'll leave it to you. Okay, thank you very much, Gwen. I have to begin with a preface. Uh, first, I want to, to thank uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants. Uh, the Bangkok Edge is really a great venture. Uh, I think that uh, you have done such a good job here, so I think that we want to be thankful. <laughs> it puts the uh, high government to shame, really, because they should be doing more for Bangkok uh, to have an ideas capital. Um, I also need to say something about the venue here. You know, the Rajini School, I, I hang out with the Rajini School <coughs> graduate and her friends uh, oftentimes. And this is a great venue that they have chosen. Uh, it's a great old high school. Uh, in fact, if you want to look at Asia, the way to see it, uh, we can see is good and bad. Uh, I think the good and bad dichotomy is characteristic of modernity, um, development in all parts of the world. You, know, you have affluence, and I think the, the interesting phenomenon in Asia to me is not the affluence, but the opulence, the Asian opulence. If you study that, you can actually, uh, 20 years ago when I was going to LSE, lots of students in Asia, not Chinese, it was Singaporeans. Some South Asian, Singaporeans, but now a lot more Chinese uh, as a reflection of the growing affluence in, in China, but also you see a lot of them uh, exhibiting their uh, wealth, uh, you know, in the, uh, kind of uh, obnoxious ways. So, so that, that is kind of uh, opulent. Uh, I have just a couple of points. Gwen is a very tough, uh, thorough taskmaster. She's emailed me 12 times today. 
uh, to ensure that I'm on the I'm on cue and uh, uh, so I've condensed now my uh, 15 minute talk to a 10 minute and now to 5 minutes so I have just a couple of points um, so I think we can frame this in all new all, you know, all new good bad but what we see in Asia uh, the future is more like the past there are more continuities in Asia than discontinuities than, than change we see a lot of changes if you look deep down the, the, you know, to understand the future and the present you look at the past so I see around here, uh, first of all, this was downtown Bangkok right here, 100 years ago. This is downtown Bangkok. And you know, I just drove from the suburb here. And it was like 35 kilometers away. That would have been the rice fields. Nobody would have gone there. So you know, now we are looking back to the past to kind of uh, revive what we aspire to, inspire to be in the future. Uh, so this venue here, for example, is really the past. Uh, in Thailand, I see a lot of... Uh, Cambodians, a lot of uh, Myanmar nationals, some Laotians, uh, all kinds of people that crisscross the land in mainland Southeast Asia, like they used to before Western imperialism came. So I think what's happening around here is that the borders that we have had in the last few centuries are now becoming decreasingly relevant, decreasingly relevant, which means that they are porous, the people will travel more, enabled, this is something new, enabled by the technologies that we haven't had before in communications and transportation. You know, I love these low-cost airlines. They are transforming Asia like uh, you cannot imagine. You can fly from third-tier cities, you know, in the middle of Sumatra to northeastern Thailand. Uh, you can never do that before. Now you can go door-to-door, -door, low cost, hundred dollars, Yangon, Bangkok. It used to take, you know, back in the war years, the war decades, three months to launch, to mount an invasion campaign. Just to get ready, just to go across the border. Now, within three hours, I can teach in Myanmar, finish and come back to Bangkok, stay Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, back to Yangon, and back. Uh, so that's breathtaking. The technologies are new. I think that uh, the other parts, the people movements, are not new. We've had this uh, before. So you go to hospitals around here, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of well-to-do uh, Myanmar nationals going to hospitals. Thailand, a lot of Laotians, some Cambodians, uh, Laotians in the Northeast. So you really have to look at the geography of Asia, of the Asian landmass, that's Asia. The Asian landmass geography and the history of it. Uh, what used to be in the past is becoming the present and the future, minus uh, Western imperialism, because I think the West is still there, but this is an era of the rest, uh, and it's not just Asia, but the rest. And, and the West is not excluded, it's not at the expense of the West. But it's actually more inclusive if you take a, a millennial view, you know, if you take a thousand years viewpoint, uh, it's actually more inclusive. So I would say that um, uh, Asia's future, you know, we are, if you draw an arc uh, on the Asian landmass, mainland Southeast Asia is the center. And Thailand happens to be the hub of mainland Southeast Asia. So we are the good place, it's, uh, it's a good capital to have the Bangkok edge because it's really the vortex of a rising region the challenge for Asia, this is Asia's time, but Asia's challenge is that it's becoming its own worst enemy. Uh, you know, if you look around, China, lots of GDP, Japan, Korea, middle power, even Australia, if the remote, but we include you, James. Um, and then for Southeast Asia, ASEAN, you know, 625 million people, 2.5 trillion GDP, trajectory of growth, of growth 5.5% plus, Thailand is the lowest, the laggard, but even Thailand, with all of its problems, it's still expanding, it's not contracting. So the, the challenge is that you, know, you have prosperity around here. And this prosperity has accumulated uh, since the end of World War II, you know, through the Cold War, and now in the 21st century, prosperity is assured for some time. What is not certain, and I think becoming more precarious and challenged, is security. It's how Asians are fighting among themselves in the East Asian uh, Sea, uh, the Sintaku, DOU, the South China Sea, these artificial islands that China, the Chinese have been doing, they must stop that. It's changing the status quo in detrimental ways. And you have tensions along the Mekong region, the Mekong River upstream, downstream, and you have all bilateral spats that have come to the fore, not to mention the infiltration, penetration of uh, Islamism, militant Islam, Islamic State, and al Qaeda, and so on. So, uh, going forward, what do we do? How do we 
ensure that Asia becomes its own best friend, that it uh, operationalizes and it really drives its own uh, self-built uh, prosperity. And the way to do it, and now we have the absence now, the absence of a global, global framework, global governance framework that can actually and that can secure uh, tensions, conflict resolution. So you have to rely on the region. So I really hope that in the South China Sea we can come up with a kind of a rules-based code of conduct and that the China-Japan relationship can be manageable. That is a key relationship to the future of Asia. Not so much the US and China. US and China perhaps in the maritime domain, but on the Asia landmass and in East Asia is really China-Japan. Uh, this is a time when Asians need to sit down and come up with their own rules. They can determine, dictate their own fate and their own future, but they must not be their own worst enemy and get into a security dilemma that spirals into a tailspin uh, that leads to tension, conflict, and perhaps even wider uh, war that we've seen in the past. We want to prevent that. <coughs> so, that's, a, a both, uh, that's an extremely mixed view as well. Would, would you care to sort of venture how you see the new Asia in a kind of optimum way with given, you know, if these security issues are dealt with, um, the, the other points that you've uh, raised, and are you optimistic or overall? The optimal new Asia, to the extent that Asia is new, um, it has to address several daunting, long-standing, deeply embedded challenges and risks. And one is this inequality between and across, uh, across and within society. So you look at each Asian country, the wealth gap is yawning within each society. And then across, across, you look at Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and you look at Singapore, even Thailand. You know, Thailand is a magnet for all kinds of uh, services. People around you become Thailand for healthcare, for tourism, uh, even for um, education and so on. So we need to spread the wealth around a bit more, both within and across. And to some extent, we need a kind of regional organization that has a uh, that has a, a, a quasi supranational uh, functionality. It has to, you know, if each man to himself, each state, each country to itself, uh, we will get into this kind of spiral, security dilemma. So regional cooperation needs to be more concrete, uh, with more teeth, and some more uh, quasi supranationality, which means the the seeding. The, the uh, sacrifice of uh, limited sovereignty in order to have a regional good, which is a public good to all. Yeah, I think that's uh, perhaps a long shot, but a good uh, proposal. I, I dread the idea of yet another regional organisation on top of ASEAN, but maybe, you know, it would... Uh... Well, ASEAN is a linchpin, of course, right? ASEAN is the, uh, um, the, the platform for all kinds of uh, regional alphabet soups and regional efforts. Without ASEAN, and we just had a seminar at Jilong Kwan University, with that. if ASEAN does not exist, what would Southeast Asia look like? It would look awful. Um, you would have, you know, uh, the Southeast Asian countries would be picked off by the major powers, there would be major power rivalry, there would be less democracy around the region, probably, and, and so on. So um, ASEAN is, remains the, the platform, but I think we need more from ASEAN. Uh, I think now they lack leadership from the Secretary General, they also lack leadership from the main countries, Indonesia, Thailand, and they have more challenges from China, which is divisive uh, for ASEAN. So ASEAN really needs to close ranks, and then in addition, it needs to lead the way that it wants to lead, which means to pull China and Japan in, not allowing the, the US or, or the US-China rivalry to spoil what could be good for the region. Right, well maybe ASEAN's uh, new push should be for a super regional body, Asian body, um, which is not a bad idea. I think um, your point, and all of you have mentioned inequality um, very strongly, and I think it's correct that this is one of the huge challenges for any new Asia, and as you said, um, you're in the property of affluence, uh, Kevin, the values, and we were talking a bit before about this old cliched notion of Asian values uh, once rooted in Confucianism, and. Uh, and you know it has become quite cliche to say Asian values, but whether you put a name on it or not, I think uh, still you know Asian cultures are more known as uh, their readiness to sacrifice the individual uh, interest for the collective good, 
and uh, this is giving way, both on a personal level, as we've seen in your books, Kevin, and uh, what you say, Jay, about um, you know the me, me, me culture of also countries, you know, putting their interests first before the kind of willingness to pull together and maybe sacrifice some things. But is this a new tension that you see, Kevin, particularly with the characters that you write about in your books? Talk about me, me, me culture. Uh, but they are very Asian as well, so they come from families where ultimately they, you know, these characters of yours will even dump a girlfriend if their parents don't like her. So that's kind of like coming back to the fold and sort of heeding traditional core values or family pressures. What's, how do you see the tension playing out on this whole issue of values and how important is Asian values? Well, I think that's all been shattered really, quite frankly, because of, of the wealth gap and because of the different degrees of affluence um, in Asia. You know, I, I think you, in mainland China, you see them still hew more to those traditions of, sort of, you know, respecting the actual Confucian values. But in a world of extreme wealth, um, you're seeing much more introspection and, and much more about service to oneself, you know, uh, much more. And that's, I think, the intergenerational struggle that you're seeing now with a lot of these families, um, the high net worth families, and, and the kids who will one day be inheriting, you know, all the riches of, of these empires and these industries, you know, they have a lot of different ideas of how things should be run, how their lives should be run. Um, I can't tell you how many, you know, young entrepreneurs from, you know, some of the biggest Asian families I know, they're all trying to remake their businesses, you know, remake, remake their businesses and make them much more stylish and fashionable or whatever. And, and I always say, well, aren't you killing the golden goose? You know, the money was made in, in mass product, and now you're trying to upscale everything. And who's going to buy this? You know, because you've got this wealth gap of just a few people that can afford these things. And you still have this huge population of people who really increasingly cannot afford these things. So what do they say? They're a bit baffled. <laughs> you know, give us a great time. But it's you too that, that you, you know, you make the point of these the poverty of affluence. Because you do see these, you know, beautiful, slick condominiums coming up more and more all over in every city in China and even in Singapore. And to me, the standard of living is going down in these sleek boxes. You know, I, I grew up in a nice house with a lawn. And Talking about poor little rich families sleeping in their well, gilded well, boxes. Exactly. You know, but, but well, I, I feel sorry for them. No, but I think even within my generation, you know, not a single one of my relatives now lives in a house anymore in Singapore. You know, these are people with perhaps high net worth, but their lives have been reduced in a very different way because of all this progress and all this prosperity. Ah, interesting. So do we think of this, of, of values, this question of values, uh, important, do you think, in the new... Right, I think of one situation, um, or actually one uh, condition of development that used to exist uh, in uh, many of these Asian economies, especially the economies that we refer to as in the old days when the Tiger economies, the South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. What these economies were experiencing in the 70s and 80s when they were really rising fast and catching up with the West. The arrangement was quite interesting, especially in terms of how individuals, families were meant to be contributing to economic development. What happened was essentially when governments were trying to organize, these governments were very much not democratic at all. These were very authoritarian governments. Uh, South Korea was seeing a military dictatorship in, uh, for many years, 70s and 80s and 60s as well. Taiwan was also very authoritarian. This, this, Taiwan is the country which has, has the record of law, implementing the longest martial law uh, in the entire world, 36 or 7 years um, until 1987-ish. Um, not to mention Singapore as well. Um, but then again, what happened was many of these governments, when they were organizing resources coming from abroad or uh, produced internally, domestically, they were kind of giving more of these resources to large business, or these businesses. While the welfare arrangements were largely left in the hands of families, 
So there was some selective welfare intervention, like Singapore and Hong Kong, where they were investing heavily in public housing. But apart from public housing per se, other areas of welfare provision were largely in uh, uh, res response, uh, basically the families were responsible for these. So families were very important unions of these economies, economic development and accumulation. They were meant to be helping each other between generations and also horizontally between you know, relatives and your siblings and so on. Reinforce traditional values. And I think this collective identity, or the, the so-called Asian value that we refer to, uh, a lot of people refer to the Confucianism, but I think this Asian value, so-called Asian value of kind of mutual support and family, the importance of family, is actually also largely due to the ways in which economy and society were constructed in recent in recent decades. This is actually the outcome, or and also the driver of economic development. And do you think it's unraveling now, or? Being and I think this is where, as uh, linking to what I was saying earlier, with the whole intergeneration uh, intergenerational conflict, I think this whole system that used to be the linchpin of these economic development during the last few decades, in the second half of the uh, 20th century. Uh, this is actually dismantling, and dismantling quite fast and very substantially. Younger generations, as I was saying, you know, they are having more difficulties in putting, you know, uh, uh, establishing themselves in societies, which are actually creating more pressure on older generations as well, because you know, they have to pay uh, their pensions, for example. And that's the old age care, for example, was largely re uh, resolved within families. There was the arrangement, generational pact, you know, older generations. It's not the kind of the social welfare arrangement but, you know, promoted by the state. It was essentially uh, within families, all the generation looking after their children, pay for their education, pay for the marriage, and, and, and even pay for housing when they get married. Uh, and in return, they were meant to be looked after by younger generations. And when younger generations are not having the ability to establish themselves in the society, this is going to come to a doomsday situation in coming years. Interesting. So that's a very negative side of New Asia. I can see <laughs> that you've got some ideas. I think that uh, you know, if you unpack Asian values, you can draw a distinction between uh, traditional values and kind of an inchoate Asian identity. Uh, so it's identity as, as well. I mean, traditional values, uh, uh, traditional values, a lot of the uh, Values we're talking about uh, deference to authority, hard work, uh, education, humanitarianism, consensus, uh, deference, and so on. I mean, these are traditional values uh, prevalent in other places in the world. If you want to look at uh, uh, an example, you can read a book uh, called, uh, I forget what the book's called, it's written by Edward Banfield from 1958. And if you read the first 30, 30 pages, it sounds like Thailand. In fact, it's South Italy. Um, so these are traditional values that undergo change with modernity and modernization. Uh, but in Asia, I think that you know you have uh, some Asianness. Uh, if you look at South Korea and Japan, they're affluent, OECD, uh, but there is something some Asianness about them. Uh, the Asian values debate uh, back 25 years ago, unfortunately, it has left a uh, a lasting imprint, you know, the Singaporeans uh, went on this crusade against the Western critics and uh, people like Bill Harry and uh, Tommy Ko and uh, Lee Kuan Yew and, and so on and so on. They went around saying that the Asian values were something special, that, that it underpinned Asian economic growth and dynamism. But that, I think, has subsided now, and the Singaporeans don't talk like that anymore. I think what we want to uh, look at is that is there such a thing as Asianness, uh, an inchoate, but um, uh, coalescing uh, Asian identity of some kind that comes along, that, that comes as a, that a company is produced by uh, affluent Asian societies. And uh, with some effort, it takes effort. I think that uh, identity is natural, but it's also uh, deliberate. So with some effort, uh, you can have, you know, and it would uh, go well, it would uh, go along with this new Asia that we want to have, a peaceful and prosperous Asia, is to look perhaps in ways to promote uh, Asianism. Right, that's interesting. I, I, it does bring to mind a point I'd like to make, and we'll then turn to questions in a short while if uh, we'll take a few. Um, I was interviewing a, a street food vendor in my street uh, some time ago last year, 
uh, doing a story on the local economy and uh, asked him how long he'd been doing it. And he said he'd been working in the same thing on the same cart since he was like eight years old and he barely went to school. Um, and I said, how did he feel about his way of life? And he said he didn't really like it, but he was doing it so his children didn't have to do it. And this is right along, I, I then got to know a lot of the vendors in my street and uh, a lot of them, their kids go to school and my clean, cleaning person and uh, that some of the security guards uh, that work around our place, their children are all going to university. It's the first time in their generations, their whole family lives, that kids have gone to universities and they're working themselves to the bone in menial jobs so they can spend. This happens in many other parts of the world, but I think particularly here. Therefore, if you get the traditional street food, food vendors sending their kids to uh, universities, this is happening also in traditional crafts and um, uh, sort of many sort of traditional parts of, of life, and also particularly in country towns and rural, where farmers want to send their kids to university. They don't want to see their kids take over the farm and plant rice all the time. They want their kids in the cities, in universities. So in a way, uh, this desperate striving to go up the ladder and uh, empower their children, is it killing, actually, is it actually actively killing some parts of, um, you know, traditional Asia as we know it? Particularly, I'm worried about the street food, I must say. But I don't see any PhDs from Jurulongkorn University serving noodles in my street. I mean, is that a concern? Do you have something to say about uh, well, the one thing I would observe is, at the very top of that pyramid, you have, you know, the high net worth Asian, and he's wearing a Patek Philippe watch, wearing a suit made on Savile Row, staying at a Mon resort, going to eat at, you know, Alain de Casse. So what does that tell you? Have we lost our Asianness? Well, maybe they have, or maybe they, this is the point of our discussion is, are, they, are these people evolving a new Asianness? <laughs> what is it, you know, I think as, as you said, Jay, it's incorrect, isn't it? Um, it's unclear, it's, you can't define it in the ways you did. It's a dilemma, you know, because you, you need effort to retain, uh, to have the capability, to, to have it both ways, to be modern and traditional, to have the old values you like, not the 12 traditional values um, of Thailand, but yet not to succumb and fall head over heels for these uh, commercializations, you know, westernization and so on. Uh, I think the, the effort has to be deliberate, but it also has to uh, aim at a setting rather than specifics. So for example, I, I today uh, very briefly went to a Buddhist ceremony. Now you can actually make merits by packages, packaging. Just pay a lump sum, everything comes for you. From the monks to the food to everything, the tables, the caterer. You just pay a lump sum and you get, you know, that's it. The whole ceremony is finished. Now that is not good. Something people are not right about that. But you know, it was natural. It's the economy of scale. It's all about scaling. But to fight scaling, you can't just go and say, okay, you have to have 12 values like this, 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 you know. Um, you have to have a setting where people value what's good about the past and that they want to have it. Um, and then at the same time, you have to keep space for them to adopt, adapt what's good about the present, uh, the values of the future, and so on. So it, it's a kind of an ongoing effort, uh, somewhat natural, somewhat deliberate, but if you want to go all deliberate, like you see in Thailand, for example, then it is rule boomerang. Right, oh, good point. So we're going to turn to questions, but I can see you're dying to say something. Uh, One thing I want to make, which is, I think we often forget this when you talk about values and so on, and easy. These values, uh, whichever values that we talk about in relation to any given society, these are the ones which have been you know, produced over a long period of time, many of these. So when you talk about Confucianism, yes, it's been you know, uh, over, uh, there you know, for many thousands of years. But when you, at this particular point in time, when you talk about the Asian value, I think what we need to remember is how condensed the experience of development has been in Asia. Studies, some studies will say, you know, uh, regarding how many years it has taken for an economy to, uh, from the moment of economic takeoff, to increase their per capita income by five times. United, United Kingdom or USA took more than 100 years. 
Asian economies like South Korea, China, Singapore, it took about 25 years. It's, what these numbers suggest is within one generation, Asia has risen, many of these Asian economies, risen from poverty to relatively rich country. What also that data tell us or imply is how packed the lives of Asians have been within one generation. And how it's more likely because of that, because of the pace of development, how more likely it is for this establishment to be disintegrating much faster. We have kind of, there's a kind of a huge, much more risk built in the society than we may have, you might have observed in, in the West. Well, that's very interesting. So you're saying Asia is accelerating, moving faster than other regions of the world in what we're seeing now. Yeah. I'd say so, uh, but the reasons why might be something that we can bring up in questions. And I'll just leave one point which I don't think we've covered and I should have maybe, I didn't have time, but um, I think another huge impact that Asia has been actively embraced more quickly than many other parts of the world is the internet culture and uh, all that social media is huge. Indonesia is one of the biggest countries in the world on uh, on social media. The uptake's been huge. I noticed though that Aung San Suu Kyi has uh, recently become um, a kind of de facto head of uh, Myanmar. Has uh, had a big uh, hissy fit recently, saying that young Burmese spend far too much time on the internet and video games. Sort of like the internet was a, a trivial thing that was um, it was a, 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 a not necessarily a positive influence, and that they were losing sight of traditional values. So anyway, I'll, um, I'll leave that, uh, maybe it'll come up in questions. I can see one at the back there. Please keep your questions short, because we've run over time. And um, I'm being, oh, is there a mic? Uh, maybe someone can, oh yeah. Yeah, so question from my old colleague and friend, Victor Mallet. I'm a big fan of based in, in Delhi. Um, I, I wanted to pick, out, um, pick up on something that um, Kevin said about uh, rich people now living uh, in flats rather than houses. And, and it, it sort of occurred to me that a lot of this is about topography. Uh, and I wanted to know what, what you all think about um, the impact of demographic change and what that's going to say about the future of Asia, and particularly the sort of weights between different parts of Asia. Um, you know, in India, which is going to become the, uh, the world's most uh, populated country pretty soon, they talk a lot about demographic dividend, which um, you know, I don't think exists because the jobs are not there and people don't have the skills. But, um, uh, and I think Professor Shin, you, you referred to the issue of pensions. But basically, I just want to know what the growing, but, you know, slowly growing now population in East Asia uh, is going to have, what, what effect that will have on on the world, and maybe you know you can look at South Asia as well. <laughs> Just to cover the, the last point, especially the um, issue of uh, slow population growth, perhaps. Yes, I mean South Korea, for example, is probably seeing the the lowest birth rate among the OECD countries, and it's actually quite worrying. Media reports and government policies. Uh, it's a very worrying situation. South of China, and mainly China, is not an exception. Uh, and I think that's also uh, the reason behind Chinese government uh, changing policy to allow you know, to change the you know, one child policy in coming years uh, has already changed it. Uh, uh, I think it's, some, it's kind of time bomb uh, really waiting to explode. And, and this is really um, a matter of survival for many of these economies in order to you know, continue the pace of development. I mean, all these economies in East Asia and Southeast Asia as well, I mean, benefited heavily in the 70s onward uh, based on cheap labor. And cheap labor was only coming into existence because there were so many people competing for jobs. So many populations, the younger generations who are entering the employment age uh, the working age you know, to compete with a limited amount of jobs and they were basically uh, willing to offer their labor in return for low wage. Of course this has changed, but in a country like China, which is so massive, 
we have the internal dynamics in the eastern provinces used to benefit from low wage. They don't do that anymore. So they relocate their facilities to other central and more western part, inland parts part of China. And China is able to sustain, has been able to sustain its development because of uh, taking the advantage of that internal uh, uh, differential wage levels. Uh, and I think this is coming to uh, an end because of this slow population growth where the next, next generation doesn't provide the same amount of you know, resource in terms of uh, surplus labor. And that's also going to be quite problematic. And this also is linked very much to issues of pension or old age care as well, because the younger generation simply are not enough or only uh, making money enough to pay for older uh, generations. And this is going to be changing for many regions, which I'll probably cover later on. <laughs> yeah, and meanwhile you've got Thailand having to ship in, you know, like use migrant labor to do all the sort of, you know, uh, all of the many, many jobs. Yes, that's precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and speaking of your question about you know the, the sort of the change and even the affluent crowd, what I see is is that even among the affluent, the, the lifestyle challenges are, are becoming bigger and bigger. You know, in, in China, the, the country has become poisoned, and all the richest people they're moving out. You know, they're getting out as soon as they can, as fast as they can. They're moving their kids to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to the U.S. They're buying buying properties there. And as far as the Southeast Asian, the affluent countries, you know, your, your property portfolio will be getting fatter and fatter, your bank account will be getting fatter and fatter, but your quality of life has gone down. You know, like my mother, who used to live in Singapore, now lives in the US, and she finds that most of her friends in Singapore, uh, where, whereas their net worth might have gone up, you know, 600% in the past decade, they don't live as well as she does, living in suburban America. Um, that mean? I'm happy, rich people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you look at Thailand, um, it's a good question about population growth. Uh, you know, generally, the more affluent, um, the lower the population growth, and generally, if you have more poverty, the, the demographics are fluid. So the manifestations uh, we have been seeing: migrations, all migrations, you know, from poor to rich, uh, seeking jobs, better livelihoods. There's also uh, going to be increasing scarcity. Uh, I mean, I do this uh, non-traditional security issues uh, involving food security, water security, so those issues will come to the fore more. Of course, we're seeing urbanization. We might see more terrorism from uh, militant Islam and so on. And overall, I think the state capacities and government performances will be overwhelmed. So it really is a bigger challenge for governments to handle the, the new challenges that come with uh, migration and population growth based on this inequality of income across countries, you'll see a lot more migration. Right. Hey, we're getting very negative here. <laughs> <laughs> um, time for another question. Yeah, one. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Oh, I will maybe squeeze in a quick. Keep your question quick and maybe we'll be allowed to have one more. Um, just a quick question on the, you know, I wonder if the panel has some concrete suggestions or proposals for respective Asian governments with reducing the uh, inequality gap, because uh, you guys have been talking about this a long time, I'd like to hear maybe your thoughts of how do we, what do we suggest to the leaders of Asia how to reduce it. Okay, thank you. One quick uh, suggestion. Anyone have proposals of reducing? You have a radical one. <laughs> Please. Uh, Keep it short. <laughs> we can ask you know, governments, of course, to implement various policies to reduce it, but because governments have already you know, established themselves and made this uh, development possible by taking the advantage of inequality, I don't think we can ask governments to do that. Um, my suggestion is largely, uh, a radical suggestion is, you know, let the property market crash. Because many of these inequalities in income and wealth largely hinges on how much people are investing in property markets, in Asian economies in particular. Singapore, South Korea, mainland China, everywhere you go to, you know, 
because of the huge condensed experience of development and which comes with very much speculative real estate market where the wealth were created. Many middle classes are investing heavily in there and they have invested a lot, they have vested interest, not only middle classes, but the government, businesses, they all have a huge interest in profit market. And these are the, the ones who actually have come to enjoy the power, the wealth. Not the ordinary people who are selling kind of food on the street market. They don't have money to work resources to invest in property market and they remain as is. While those who actually were able to invest in property market uh, some time ago and, and taking advantage of the rising prices and being able to afford more uh, wealth and so on and, and invest it abroad as well. And I think the whole fictitious you know, amount of you know, surplus you know, being created in the property market is actually a major source of inequality. And what I would say is, let the property market crash. Ordinary people don't lose out. It's the only rich ones who actually make huge money will lose out. Well, that's true. I think that's an attractive way to pay the I can see this room is not full of property owners. <laughs> but uh, I guess... Uh, Everyone we... sell now. <laughs> Which we, uh, which we haven't got time to go into, but I guess if you let property crash, you're letting banks crash. If you let banks crash, you're letting, like, I mean, you could, that's a very radical proposal because we're talking about taking Asia back to year zero, but that's attractively radical, perhaps. Um, one more. Uh, Arita, you have, well, I think we've got to, we, we're over time, so do you mind? We'll, yeah, yeah, there's uh, one here. Actually related to the first question, so I'll be brief. And uh, we've heard about inequality uh, and in historical perspective, uh, economic development has been uh, suggested to be the source of uh, inequality. If you look uh, in the past, industrialization also led to inequality in Europe. And uh, so my specific questions are two things. First, do you think that there is any something that is particularly wrong with economic development in Asia? Second. Is the state in Asia not doing enough to uh, eradicate those inequality, and that's why we are seeing inequality more across Asia. So, thanks. So I think that goes a little bit back to uh, Victor's question, but uh, can you? I think there's an immense artificial bubble that everyone's conspiring to keep building and keep pumping up. That's Which is I about think. assets. Yes, about, absolutely. Uh, and and that not just the next on Asia. It's, it's, it's global. Suggesting it is a conspiracy, or you mean inadvertently a conspiracy? I think both, really. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, J.D., have you well, I think the question, of course, I can answer this in uh, more detail later on. Um, but uh, very quickly, I would say that uh, so far, you know, Asian economic development has been successful, normally successful. Uh, it's been export driven, as we know. But I think that this also has a downside. You also have to to question, you know, if, you don't, if we didn't do it that way, how could we have grown it? In what other way could we have done it? So I think for its time, it was good. Now it has to shift uh, to a more consumption-based uh, model and growth, and I think that's happening now in Indonesia and probably Thailand and so on. And then you need in tandem, in tandem, you need a more egalitarian society and better education system and so on to, to do it right uh, going forward to, to reduce, this, reduce this inequality. Um, so it's, it's in time. A new kind of uh, growth model with uh, uh, some reforms, education, uh, I think making media access cheaper um, and making a more kind of rule of law, character society. But you're talking, to enforce that, you're talking about this super national, super sovereign regional body that would force, I mean, back to Wolfgang's point too, what are the proposals to actually um, reduce? How do you enact that? Well, ideally you would do it uh, in, you know, in concert, different governments, but of course that doesn't happen. So you do what you can, and to a degree that you can make it uh, multi-government, intergovernmental, then, then that would be good. But otherwise, uh, there's a lot of limitations because sovereignty is sacred around here. Right. Okay, well, we're over time. I, I'd just like to sum up and say, I think we'll come away from this uh, very, if not confused, mixed about what New Asia really is and whether it's a positive or negative. Although I'd have to say overall I'm looking at what's going on around the world and Middle East and, uh, and the global uh, financial turmoil and things. Asia is not really a bad place to be in. So perhaps the new Asia is not really a bad thing. I'd just like to say thanks to all our panellists. I thought it was an excellent discussion.